Tonight, we are very privileged to have the chairman and CEO of Time Warner, Jeff Bukas, with us. And I want to thank Jeff for making time to, to see us. Um, Jeff is, has been the chairman and CEO since uh, 2009. He became the chairman in 2009 and CEO in 2008. Previously had been president and chief operating officer of Time Warner and rose up through the ranks there at uh, home box office, HBO. Uh, he joined there in 1979 and ultimately became the head of HBO during one of its most profitable periods under his leadership. Uh, Jeff, prior to that, had worked at Citibank. And prior to that, he was a graduate of uh, Stanford Business School and Yale and Deerfield Academy. Uh, Jeff is a person who's involved in a number of philanthropic activities, but also very involved in his, uh, his school affairs. And he's on the advisory board at Stanford Business School and also at uh, Yale Corporation. He's a member of the Yale Corporation Board. And we're very pl pleased to have you here today. And thank, I thank you for having me. Appreciate your taking the time. Um, so the company that you uh, run now is one of the largest media companies in the world. As I un understand, it's about 29, uh, let's see, I think it's about $35 billion market cap. Yeah. 30, uh, uh, 4 million, uh, 34,000 employees, is yes. that right? That 34,000 employees, 35 billion market cap, and about 29 billion in revenue. 30. Uh, 30, okay, <laughs> sorry, 30 billion. So, running uh, one of the largest media companies in the world, um, there's a lot of pressure on you, and you're obviously a major figure in the entertainment world. It's reported that when you were a boy, you said to your parents, I wanna be in the entertainment world, and your parents said, well, that's not possible because you're not Jewish. And <laughs> Is, is, is that apocryphal, and why did you want to be in the entertainment You know, it, it is apocryphal. That was a, a joke intro to a dinner at the AJC. Okay. They, they never actually said that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> to break up stereotypes. Okay. But, so, uh, why did you why, want to be in the entertainment business? Why did I want to do it? Um, you know, the, originally because HBO in those days was, just stood out as something different. It was a company that had a mission, and the mission was, Let's totally change television. Let's create a kind of television that has no advertisement. Now, since we all know, at least up till then, that TV gets paid for by advertising, you have a uh, question on how you're going to get money for this. And basically, it was you, the viewers, pay for it. And that really changed everything, because you're now trying to make TV that is worth paying for. And that led to changes in the business model, the kind of the programming that it had. Uh, tremendous adventure, and the, the mission of that kind of TV has now infected every channel, and it's still going strong at HBO. So, what is it that HBO does that makes some of its shows pretty popular? Um, you know, do you have uh, you pay artists more than other shows? Uh, do you have better producers? What is it that makes your shows so popular? Well, you know, you're on a key question because not all the show. We're not trying to actually make the shows. Uh, popular because we're not getting paid based on how many people watch the show. That would be the other television, ratings-based television. Right. And there's a lot of virtue to that because, you know, what popularity does with you as viewers expressing your desires shapes TV, and it should. But in the case of HBO, we're trying to make programming or buy it because we have both, you know, movies we buy and then uh, series that we make. We're trying to make things that are worth, in your mind, that are worth paying for, where you don't care how many ratings points, how many million people are watching. And if you think about the variety of HBO shows from, uh, in today's world, uh, Game of Thrones, or, you know, which is very popular and is coming back shortly, so stay tuned. Or Luck, the new series David Milch wrote, Michael Mann directed it, Dustin Hoffman's playing the lead in that TV series. Um, these are not all made to, to draw the maximum audience. They're made to make okay. an interesting show that really stands out and is different. But you must know which shows have the highest ratings after they're, they're over. Which is the highest rating show that's, rated show that's ever been on HBO? Uh, it's, a, it's a draw between roughly the same. Sopranos and its hit years. Um, True Blood, which is on there now. Game of Thrones coming back. So those have been the highest rated. But we don't get paid based on whether you watch those shows. We get paid if you sign up for HBO. And there are plenty of smaller shows. Think of Entourage. Think of uh, Eastbound and Down. Think of some of the documentaries. Think of uh, Game Change that we just right. put on 
this week, the movie about the election, the last election, those don't necessarily have the highest ratings, but because you know that those are on the network, hopefully you will subscribe to the network. And we have about a third of the citizens in the United mm -hmm. States subscribing to HBO. They're paying us every month. And we use that money to make what we hope is breakthrough program. But you were the head of HBO when the AOL deal was announced? Yes. And what was your reaction to that deal? Uh, well. You want my I next question? Or no, I'll tell you, we'll go to that. We're here in Washington, which is the home of AOL. AOL had done a fantastic thing. I think, as we all know, that deal was in 2000. AOL was the biggest internet portal. Everybody was signed up to it. And the concern that, I, that, that some of us had when that was announced, because we didn't know if it was going to work out well or, or badly, but if you were concerned, uh, because AOL was basically valued equal to Time Warner. Time Warner had six or seven big companies making seven or eight billion dollars. AOL was a new company making two billion, valued the same. Um, the question really was, is, are these internet stocks, and in this case, the portal companies like Yahoo and AOL, are they going to justify those valuations? Are they going to grow into the always harder to tell uh, internet future? And how, if you take an AOL or a Yahoo or a Microsoft network and you put it with a content company, what does that do? Is that going right. to work? I mean, what is the point of that? And I think what, was, what became clear, not just at AOL, but also at Yahoo and actually at MSN, is it's not that easy to rationally connect an internet service like a portal right. or an, on, an ISP with somebody that makes movies, TV shows, magazines. It's not clear exactly what that okay. connection is. All right, well that deal is behind you now, and now it's uh, Time Warner. Um, you still are a major magazine publisher. Yeah. Well, what is the future of magazines in an er era, era of technology and when people are reading things online? Why are you still in the magazine business? Well, the magazines is not the buggy whip business. The magazines is, you all hopefully read these every day. That's the content business. That's both journalism uh, of various stripes. It's some entertainment. Think of style and celebrity magazines. We have everything from news at time to people with celebrity. All of those are quite strong in readership. There's no, magazine readership is holding up. And it's migrating to the web. It's migrating to your tablet. So if you pick up any tablet that's in this room and you push in people, Sports Illustrated at a time, fortune, you can read your magazine for free because you paid for it on that tablet. And we have put all our magazines in that format. We're the first publishing company to do that. And we see the future magazines basically as not just printed words on those screens and in print, but also moving pictures. Because if you go to the Sports Illustrated app, let, let's use the, if you go to the People app and you look for Golden Globes, you're going to find moving pictures of the Golden Globes. And if you want to go deeper into a story or a person, you can do that. So the power of all this journalism that we collect, which we can't print in every magazine that we put on the truck, we can still give it to you as a reader or a subscriber to that magazine. Ten years from today, we will still be printing magazines, you and everybody else, or everything will be online? You think we'll still be printing magazines yeah, ten years? We'll be doing both, but uh, you'll have your choice of whether you want to read your favorite magazine in paper uh, or have it on your screen. And the most profitable magazine, I thought, in the country is People magazine. Is that yes. still the case? Yes, it is. And I and guess going you're... Up. You're a religious reader of it, I assume? Yes, I, I get to it right away. Right, right. So um, you are the biggest producer of content, I think, for television. Is that true? Yeah, we are at Warner Brothers making television shows to sell to CBS, ABC, right. NBC, and all the cable channels. And then we have the Turner Networks, TNT, TBS, True TV, and then we have HBO and Cinemax. So basically, the biggest part of Time Warner United States and globally is television. Now, CNN was started uh, many years ago by Ted Turner, and at the time it was considered a novelty to have an all-news show network. 
Um, today, time, uh, CNN seems to be in the middle. There are cable shows on the left and some on the right. CNN, I guess, tries to be down the middle. Is it difficult to be down the middle when so many people seem to want cable shows on the right or the left? You know, we don't, I'll agree, you know, I, I think most of us understand it that way, but maybe that's not the fullest way to understand it. So yeah, we try, when we hear down the middle, what we mean is not down the middle without clarity of opinion or, ex or examination of all the different points of view. We think it's journalism. So our company, whether it's CNN or our print magazines, we, we're trying to do what we all grew up thinking journalism was, which is something that is objective, that gets you all the points of view. So the idea to us of shrinking what we do down to one or another political point of view, because that's not the only issue, it's political spectrum. It's, there's a lot of different things happening in the world, and if you're gonna cover them uh, objectively, you need to cover them across that spectrum, mm -hmm. but there's tremendous amounts of things that are affected, not really by political thinking or political action or policy, but just happening as either technological developments, demographic developments, cultural developments, so it's not to reduce it to politics and then pick a side, to us is um, really abandoning what we set out to do. So on CNN you had Larry King for quite a while and now you have a, a new host, how, how is that working out? It's working out very well. The, uh, there's been a lot of vigor in the coverage that Piers Morgan has done on, think of the Arab Spring uh, last year. And it's pretty lively when we have celebrities on, we're, we're always, that's an interview show, so we're depending on the events of the day, we're mixing either uh, you know, some, some cultural or celebrity events or maybe news events that have happened in the world. He has a very good range of, to do both. Uh, and CNN itself, if you think of Anderson Cooper's show every night, Aaron Burnett's show now at seven o'clock, is uh, we think it's broadening out in terms of uh, what we're covering and the depth and analysis we're trying to bring to it. Let me ask you a question I once asked you before. So the ratings are up. Ratings are up. Well, that's not HBO. That's you, you pay. That's a subscription-supported thing and an ad-supported thing. And the ratings are up quite well this year over the year before. It's yeah. election year, so there's some lift that we get from that. So when you're watching election returns, you ever flip the channels to see what the other people are doing? Or Absolutely. Just, just watch yeah, CNN. I flip around. Uh, and you all probably do, too. You should, I think. Make and sure you're getting a fair view. So um, I, asked, I travel overseas a bit, and as I, I once asked you about this, I wanted to ask you again. When I go overseas, I'd like to know what's going on in the United States, so I like to turn on CNN, but I always have something called CNN International overseas, which is telling me about rugby and soccer and other things I don't really care that much about. Why don't you just broadcast CNN that's here overseas? It would cost less. and. Most of your viewers are probably Americans traveling. What's wrong with that analysis? Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that analysis. And a lot of our viewers are Americans traveling. But the debate we have, and this is, I'm no stranger to that debate, is, well, wait, we got a lot of people that are, you know, resident nationals of all the country. CNN is the, one of the largest along with BBC, you know, TV news sources, and online it is the largest uh, global news service that people turn to. So you have people of all nationalities all over the world watching it to get a view from the states and some view about the U.S., but not exclusively. So if we were putting on what serves an American audience on CNN right. domestic, overseas, we really would not be serving those people, and in fact, you said it very well, but we also get the, ex the other half of that debate is people saying, you know, when I go on to watch CNN International and I'm in India and I'm in Hong right. Kong and I hear all this stuff about some municipal thing in the United States or something, why, why do you go on about this? this? This is not the world. You know, I want to hear about your view of what happened in the election in Russia. That's what I want from CNN. So it's, you know, it's, you, you can't please everybody even though we, we try. Well, let me ask you, today you are seen as, uh, by some people, as a large media company based in the United States and many of your uh, best customers and biggest businesses here. Are you uh, doing things outside the United States? How much activity do you have outside the United States? What are you doing in China or Europe, for example? Yeah, we have about 30% uh, 
29, 30% of the revenue of Time Warner is outside the United States. So it's quite international. And that's a mix of activities. You think of what we do. We have the world's largest uh, studio, Warner Brothers, producing both films and television shows. And half of what, War half at least, a little more than half, of what Warner's takes in revenue, book selling TV and film, is outside the United States. So that's that part. And then if you look at the networks, whether it's CNN we just talked about, or HBO, TNT, Turner Classic <coughs> Movies, some channels we own specific to Europe or uh, Latin America, we have a lot of television channels um, all over the world. When you go to China, there's actually less business done by American media companies because it's not, China, as some of the developing countries, they don't uh, readily take in a lot of unregulated or unedited content, in not just news, but entertainment. And uh, <clears throat> there's a pretty vibrant uh, piracy market in developing countries, um, China and East Asia, where people are watching our American-produced movies. They just aren't paying us for those. So it's a great business for somebody. And if you can own that, you should. Is there any legislation you have in mind that might fix well, that? Well, I didn't problem? really want to mention it. Uh, we, <laughs> we, 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 we don't, you know, we, there's been effort. There, there should be some very considered work and thinking done by not just the media companies, but the internet companies and the pharmaceutical companies, really every industry that produces intellectual property or high value products that depend on patents or rights. And we've got to figure out how to have those be valued and not hollowed out by what would essentially otherwise be criminal activity for profit. It's not this is not altruistic sharing. This is people stealing drugs or media products or whatever it is, software made by Microsoft, and essentially consuming it for free or paying uh, an organized crime syndicate to take it. And while there's a lot of controversy, it's not so easy to figure out how to do that and make sure that in doing it, you don't impinge on the freedom and innovation of the internet. Either that, nobody wants to do that. But you know, there ought to be a way to create a vibrant internet and preserve it, and not have it simply used as the avenue for every kind of, you know, dis you know, taking away of, of the products that people and are making. Now, Time Warner is uh, an aggregation of many companies. It was. Uh, uh, Warner Communications, they kind of uh, bought time and merged in, and then ultimately AOL, and that was spun off. But there are a lot of acquisitions over the years. Since you've been the CEO, you've actually divested some things. Yeah. So you div divested your cable business, and you have interest in making acquisitions. And if so, what area would you like to grow by acquisition? Not that you're going to tell us specific ones right now. But yeah, as soon as anybody right. says, you know this from Carlisle, that right. you know, I'm thinking of buying right. that, your stock just you know, <laughs> goes like that. So um, what, what we've done, and, and whether it's the divestiture side or the acquisition side, is we've tried to really fill out, strengthen, support our position in content creation. We, you know, we've moved the company from kind of what had been a bit of a conglomerate you know, on cable distribution to what we know how to do, which is to make really high quality movies, television shows, television networks, branded magazines, and so whether it's journalism or entertainment products, we know, we, we've got a pretty good now um, experience management system and population of people that know how to really do that at the cutting edge and to create evolution in the business models. Because we all know how film started or TV started and then magazines. All of that has to be evolved into a being on the internet, having it work for viewers and consumers, but having a, a business model that pays for it. And we are in the forefront of that, whether it's in publishing, networks, or our movie studio. But if you and so that's when we look about you know, acquisitions, if we ever need any of those. We're basically thinking about what do we need to help okay. that transition in digital or to help us geographically take this capability and make it stronger somewhere else in the world. 
The man who first put Time Warner together was Steve Ross, and you worked uh, there when he was there. What was he like? Uh, was he a brilliant deal maker? Yeah, he was. He was a very uh, forward-thinking deal maker, having started in the funeral business, into the parking lots, into the media business. Some people would say, that sounds like it's all the same. But, <laughs> but, uh, and we, we kind of continued that, although we had a few deals that didn't work so well. How would you compare him to Ted Turner? What was it like working with Ted Turner? Well, Ted was not a deal maker. Ted was a uh, innovator, visionary to create companies. Think what he created. He created TBS first, which is take your local broadcast station, put it out over the satellite into every cable system in America. That's how you could get Andy of Mayberry on the Superstation and on your local Channel 11. That's how that started. Then he figured out how to create a 24-hour news channel, CNN. And, you know, if you're in the business side, because you, you know, okay, 24-hour news, we get it, your viewers, you saw it. The real issue on the business side, if you were a cable network person in those days, was how do you get that distributed and how do you get the money from the cable operators and the subscribers to support CNN. So he did that. Then he took a library, Hanna-Barbera library of cartoons, and made the Cartoon Network, and so on. So they grew Turner that way, uh, not by deals, by in-house invention. Right. So you now you're in the entertainment business, the creative content business. Um, it's often said that the egos are large in the movie business or TV business. Um, uh, how would you compare the, the egos when you go to Hollywood to see your movie production people with your television people, with your magazine people? Who are the easiest to deal with? You know, that's, I probably shouldn't answer that. shouldn't answer that. Okay. <laughs> all right. I didn't say who was the hardest. I said it was the easiest. Okay. Yeah. They're all easy. You know, I say, I'd pro you know what? I would probably insult the movie people if I didn't give them the big ego award. <laughs> okay. Very diplomatic. Now, uh, we're in Washington today, and I understand you had uh, a lunch that hosted by a vice president with uh, Prime Minister Cameron, and I assume you're not going to tell us what he told you, but um, by virtue of the fact you're in Washington, do you spend a lot of time here, and does the government affect a lot of what you're doing? We, we, I don't spend as much as what we did. We used to have a regulated business, our cable company, which we, when we were the biggest media company, we, we spun it off to our shareholders. And if you, any of you out here are shareholders of Time Warner Cable and Time Warner, you have done better than any other media company because of the cumulative performance of the two separately. So I just want to put, point that out, because not enough people have written that. You haven't gotten enough. I haven't gotten enough credit for that. So that did happen, but since we now have you know, content companies, you know, magazines, networks, and studios, we don't uh, we're not regulated per se. We do come down in order to try to uh, understand where regulation is going and what the view in the public sector is about how media should evolve because there are various calls for intervention yeah. that happen and we want to make sure everybody is educated before some unintended consequences happen. Now, would you ever consider going to government yourself if you could be appointed a cabinet position or run for something? Or? I think it would be better for everyone if I stayed in the private sector <laughs> trying to uh, produce high quality journalism and create an independent you know, and bold viewpoint in entertainment. So to keep up with your empire around the world, do you, what technology devices do you use? Do you use an iPad? Do you use iPhone? Do you use BlackBerry? What, what is it that you walk around with and ha carry? Uh, Blackberries, iPads, uh, cell phones, um, more than just Apple phones. I like to be in the Android Chrome camp and the okay, and you're Apple you camp. You know, they have a lot of issues. You use Twitter? Are you, uh, I do, you know, our company uses Twitter. And CNN is, I think, the number one site. The, the, CNN has more Twitter, Twitter followers than any other news source. I don't think that public co-CEOs are allowed to use Twitter or Facebook. I hope not. That was no. a, I, I apologize. That was a, an attempt at a joke. It doesn't seem like a good idea. <laughs> Probably not allowed. But uh, 
So your job is one, you're running one of the largest media companies in the world. When you're not running one of those, that, that company, what do you do for relaxation? Are you a golfer, a hiker, or any? I'm a, uh, I go sailing or skiing. Okay. Or I try to hang around with my kids. And let's suppose you're, you're hiking and you're... I like hiking. When you come back to the house and you turn on TV and you see CNN and you see somebody doing something you don't like, do you call up the host of the show and say, I didn't really like this? Or how do you convey your concerns about shows? You don't get I, would, well, I would like to understate my uh, involvement on editorial matters, both journalistic and entertainment. Understate. Okay. Right. <laughs> in other words, but no, I don't call up. And we try to, here's what we try. We try to, and this is serious. I mean, we, we really think it's important. And it's basically how we deliver the quality that we do in journalism at Time and CNN. And it's how we deliver the quality that we do, both commercially recognized, because we tend to outcompete most of those other media companies in our movies, our TV shows. I mean, we, we have the lead usually earnings in uh, film, theatrical films, in uh, TV shows we sell to the networks, in our cable networks, and we're the lead share in the magazine businesses in which we operate. So that's pretty good, and the way we do that is we have a very strong commitment to quality and autonomy of our editorial people, our creative people. Now that doesn't mean that we have no supervision or involvement with how they try to create that, that quality. But it obviously would not work, given the scope, the size, the diversity of what we do, if we had political powers coming down, second-guessing, and punishing things that don't go well. So I try to support our people in making, you know, trying things out and giving them the resources to do breakthrough things. And so far, that's not just me, that's everyone in our company. That's the culture of Time Warner. Well, since you've been CEO of the, of the company, what do you think is the biggest challenge that a CEO faces running a publicly traded company today? I mean, what is different than what you thought it would be? Uh, yeah, there's, um, you know, th th there's so much, um, and it's good, I guess. There's so much, you know, different opinion that floats around, which I, that part is good. But it's hard to get people, because everyone is, it's kind of skittish and insecure about sticking to a more long-term program, whatever it is, whether you're trying to aim for a certain brand that you want to create, you're trying to get a certain voice in a, in a, in a TV show or a magazine, whether you're trying to get results over the long run instead of the short run. And this is not the first time anyone said this. There's so much uh, kind of confusion out there. Currently, I would say the biggest source of kind of strange and not particularly logical fads that you all hear every day is connected to inter developments in the internet because we all know there have been so many breakthroughs and kind of stunning, uh, you know, they get going because of the nature of the internet, it connects to now seven billion people. So if it's got any application, it takes off and it's big very fast. So everyone has gotten used to thinking oh my gosh, you know, maybe this thing is going to take over the world. So everybody gets a bit excited, and they don't sit down and say, well, what does this new development really amount to? How does it work? Is it doesn't mean it won't be a new thing that has uh, some lasting power. But the idea that everything's going to, you know, that all normal things you've come to know are going to be overturned every Thursday is, is about what happens. And uh, it just... Clearly, we've seen so many of these. Now, the market wants to churn that because, you know, pro-cyclical pushing on that can make you money on the way up and the way down. So there's plenty of reasons why it all kind of runs away. But you got to know, you know, which things are real developments and which things are kind of fear and paranoia. Now, if the vice president had pulled you aside today and said uh, the business community always is asking for something from the government, what would you like the government to do to help business uh, in the United States that could help your company or all business, what would you think the U.S. government can do to most help your company and other major companies? What would you have said okay. had he asked we, that? We're just to say, I mean, um, I hope it's true. I don't like to say things that aren't. It, we haven't, I don't remember anything where we have, in, in case in which we've asked the government for anything specific to our company. 
And we don't think of that as appropriate for government, you know, getting something with the government. Generically. Yeah, what we, what we think uh, strongly is that not just our government, but the developed countries' government, we should support protection of intellectual property and try to do it in a way that is equal to how we support physical property. We should try to figure out how to do that, because intellectual property is increasingly important to maintaining the most important human activities on the planet. And if it works for the physical economy, it ought to work for that. And then the second thing that goes with that, and uh, I'll say, is we ought to try to keep putting forth a free trade regime in the world. And I know that means different things to different people, and there's a lot to be worked out, but it's very much in the interest of you know, freedom generally, political freedom, freedom of expression, uh, prosperity, and the ability to develop things that cure the material needs of the people on the planet, to have property protected you know, and not stolen, and to have free trade rather than you know, arbitrary political units distorting what people want to do. Now you, you are in so many different areas of our economy and other economies, but in our economy, so you get numbers presumably every month, maybe daily, about TV sales or ratings or magazine sales. How do you think our economy is doing now? Are we growing at 2, 3, 4 percent based on what you see? And in the United what is, States. In the United States. What is your biggest concern about the economy in the well, United States? Uh, the total looks like it's somewhere around 3, a little, maybe a little under, and there's a debate of whether it's going to dip under. In the businesses we're in, and I would just take the television business as uh, a bit of a positive marker on this, the television business in the United States and all across the world is very strong. And I'm not saying that so much, in, it's not my interest in it, uh, or our company's focus on it, is not so much short term this year, et cetera. From a long term, where's the business evolving? What business should we be in? the health of the TV business across the world is, it is one of the strongest businesses in the world. The viewership, and I'll, you can start in America, viewership's up, number of people subscribing is up, the amount that people, the number of hours people want to use their TV is up, the budgets for programming and the quality of programming is up dramatically, the earnings of all TV companies, producers, or networks is up. And that same thing is true in every continent on the, in the world, sometimes, and most of them at higher levels even. So TV is a bursting industry, and the big thing about it, which is even more positive than that, is that television, certainly here, is going on the internet. And I think we've all seen how powerful the internet is and the devices that you have connected to it. If you can get that thing which you've, you know, for the last 40 years we've all been, you drive by houses, there's a blue screen running in the house. That screen is now following you wherever you want to go. And you can talk about what's good or bad about that, but it means that the things you choose to watch are now available to you, whatever you want, whenever you want, on whatever device you want, and it's getting cheaper all the time. So the quality of it, the effectiveness of it, the ease of use, and the is all going up, the price is going down. That's a fantastic business. Um, it's basically the internet and television are the same thing. So you don't really care whether people are watching your content on iPads or Sony televisions, it makes no difference to you based on? Right, well it'd be, it'd be the same as what you all would ask. Do you care when you watch your favorite show whether the television, you know, under the screen, you look at a Sony Philips, Sonya, or what do you care? I don't think you do. So in your business career, what was the time that you were most worried about your career that you thought, uh oh, I made a mistake and I might not be around here much longer? Was there something that happened that you were really worried about? No, I thought I, the whole thing has been fun for me, but there was, uh, there was, HBO was pretty turbulent in the early years. I, I don't, there were numerous uh, CEOs that went over the side. Um, and then Time Warner was pretty turbulent during some of those mergers. And you know, the Time and Warner one had a lot of predictions that all the time people would be killed and so on. I mean, all that happened. And then the AOL merger was such a big merger. It was, I think, the biggest merger in dollar terms, $265 billion, when it went through in 00. And the AOL side 
which was 165, ended up valued at less than 10, which caused 100 billion of write-offs the next year, 100 billion, which is more than what Time Warner was before the merger. And then in the next couple of years after that, another 30. So, um, you know, that is not a success, I think you'd have to say. <laughs> and what happens when, you, when you're in a company where that happens, that causes tremendous, if you think of all the pressures and strains, good and bad behavior in a, in a political organization like a company, you throw that into it, and it really tests everybody's you know, personality and relationships and confidence. And so from the management, wondering, well, who the hell is responsible for this, up to the board, which, ha which came from both original companies, it makes it, it put a strain on everybody. So it, it's been uh, interesting. So as you looked at the, the difficulties of running a publicly traded company, are there role models that you have tried to follow, people you've, you really uh, admire who've run publicly traded companies and done well? And well, I didn't know many of them personally. So um, I, I, yeah, I've had, the way I think, I've had so many mentors throughout my time at Time Warner. And I actually think, and I'm not going to name names on this, but even some of the people that uh, ran parts of our company for, and for whom I worked, who, who, who did things that are you know, not good you know, or made a mistake, you can learn from that. They also did a lot, all of them did a lot of things that were good too. So I basically tried to learn from everybody. You know, what, how did this happen and why did this, guy, why, why did this person get in trouble and you know, can I learn not to do that if I get in that situation? What would you like your legacy to be? At some point, you will presumably leave this position, uh, maybe many years from down the road. But yeah. when you're looking back on it, what would you like people to say you did, and what was your legacy? Well, I really would like for the, the, the leadership in quality and uh, authenticity of Time Warner's journalism and our entertainment, whether it's our movies, our shows, our networks, um, I would like us to keep to stay and continue leading, the, being at the top in terms of that quality and not failing in the fundamental mission of using our mechanics to make really interesting com content for people and affecting the world that way, which is what we've been doing and we, I want to do that. And the, in order to do that, and this is really the business part for the management, we need to evolve um, the business models that started in print magazines, TV over the air, movies on the screen at a theater. We need to evolve those so that they work to support that creative enterprise in the internet century so that everybody gets our products the way they want, uh, that it's affordable for everyone on the planet to get it so that it increases that you know, kind of civic aspect of what we do. And we need to keep the, the business viable. So we need to preserve really the economic support. And I just say specifically, I don't want to be vague about it, there's a tremendous uh, freedom that goes with being able to pay for content. I'm not saying it's the only thing. It's great that you can have advertising supported things. Some things, think of you know, broadcast TV, can be 100% advertising supported. But there's a big misconception that having things be, quote, free with some business model to later be described, usually it means advertising, which usually goes to mass, scale, and low common denominator. That is not the answer to that. That's one of the things we should have in our mix. But you know, it's been a huge advance of the quality of expression. Just think of television. If you're uh, an American and you grew up in the world of three broadcast networks, we all remember that. That was free. And it was good. It was good commercial stuff. But in order to select those shows, three networks divided up 90% of the audience. If your show didn't have 30% of the American people watching, it wasn't viable. Shows that didn't do that did not get made. And that was the world we were in before we had the freedom and choice to pay for what we wanted to watch. And that was started with HBO, and now it's a hundred other channels, from Discovery Channel to Fox News to MTV. And now you have quality and distinction because you're not stuck 
with just a scale business run by a giant platform that consolidates the ads. That's been progress in the television business. And if you go to the internet, which allows us all to get all those different channels and 100 new channels from Netflix to YouTube and to have more and more choice and diversity, more and more difference, more varied business models to support it, remember that as you go to that world, the new one, that there are some platforms that are essentially gigantic, consolidated commercial platforms that essentially the internet advertising is concentrated in the hands of three or four companies. Um, let's just all understand what that means if you don't preserve uh, a model of being able to pay for what you want to read or watch. Right. And if it all goes in the hands of a giant ad platform that not only takes mass audience, but tracks everything you do and uses it in ways that, frankly, the public is going to have some difficulty keeping track with how is my information being used. These are important questions um, as we go into the future. And I would, you know, you asked, what do I care about for our company? I want our company to evolve into that stage and still provide the choice and, you know, quality of voice in entertainment and journalism that we have up to now. Well, uh, we have time for one or two questions from our members. Anybody question? One or two right here. How are you doing? Thank you for the presentation. I'm still struggling a little bit with your business model because if someone purchases HBO, they purchase it just as a network and there's a series of different shows that show on HBO. Uh, as the moderator asked you, if you're not concerned with ratings, how do you determine which programs you pull in and pull out of HBO? Because you've taken things on and off during the course of the evolution. How do you make that determination? So you're, you're at so if you're buying the whole service and it's you know 30 shows which it is how do we pick which ones we keep or and which ones we produce from scratch net of a ratings construct yeah well we uh it's, it's a very good question that's, that's what we spend all week debating with each other should we do this show or should we do that show and uh we basically try to put together a total service of shows. Some of them are big hits, which we think will be wide audience appeal. Some of them are fairly narrow because we think that story or that kind of audience group hasn't been served. They've never seen anything focused for them. And when we put that together in a service, you all decide whether you want to subscribe to that service. And you know, you're not going to watch everything that's on HBO. It's the question of whether you value that choice of having those kind of unusual, uh, true to their potential kinds of stories brought to life. And what that does, because that's quite a different model than, say, mass advertising, ratings only TV, which is, very, by the way, I don't, I'm not speaking against that. There are some really strong commercial, big appeal shows that are made for the maximum audience. And there's nothing wrong with a giant hit commercial ad-supported show. Nothing wrong with a huge commercial movie. There's just different kinds of needs that you're serving in the audience. And what happens as you go through that spectrum is that the, the creators who have the script idea or the directors who are going to bring it to life or the actors who have to choose, am I working on a movie or am I working on a show for HBO, they now have a much richer choice than they used to about uh, a lot of diversity in what they as an actor or director can do. So now you are, we, it is much more common, we never saw this 10 years ago, for big movie actors to be on a television show. You, you, you know, you've all seen that. And so there's a, a lot of vitality going on between the television business and really excellent uh, movies and shows and the movie business, which has everything from the artist to uh, a really popular, you know, designed for the world movie. All right, one more question. What is your favorite, my question was, what is your favorite show on television when you're watching television? Well, I can't answer it because, uh, <clears throat> first of all, I gotta pick one of our shows. I know. Which, by the way, it, it is our shows. But secondly, if, then it's between our networks, which I won't do. And then third, Warner produces some shows that we sell to other networks that are really good, so. 
I, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> ducking. I love all of our children. A final, and, a final question. It'll be easier for you. Um, do you ever get complaints about who is the time person or man of the year? And what do you do with those complaints? We, let, let me, we always get complaints. <laughs> and we get more than complaints. <laughs> we get... You get cancellations? So we are, you get people boycotting, calling your house. You, know, you get well, people that are really upset well, about this, well, which I'm, is probably good. It means they're still paying attention. Can I mention... <laughs> The Time Magazine was named the hottest magazine of the year by Adweek last year. I hope that's not too shame. O'Reilly plugs stuff on his show. So. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you plug one, one more thing, the final. I, I, it's often every year when you have the uh, Sports Illustrated uh, swimsuit issue, Yeah. you always get the next week um, mothers writing in saying they want to cancel the subscription for their children or something like that. Do you actually have cancellations when, when the, after the swimsuit issue, or that's just... Not true. You actually have increases. Well, there's the mothers canceling and the fathers signing up. <laughs> so, all right. Well, Jeff, uh, I want to thank you very much thank for you, uh, thank this. You for Let me give you a gift. Thank you. Um, let's see. I have a gift right here. This is a uh, wow. map of the uh, District of Columbia, the original map. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jeff Bucus, thank you very thank much. You, David. Thank, thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.